Hello, and welcome to this webinar on location-based data in crisis situations. My name is Jessica Windham, and I'm director of the AAAS Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights, and Law Program. And I'm very pleased today to be joined in this webinar by Alan McCachran of Penn State University and Laura Guzman of The Engine Room. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the ethical considerations that arise in the context of crisis when location-based data, particularly that which is voluntarily created, is intended to be collected and applied, whether for research purposes, documentation, monitoring, or response. We'll present principles and guidelines that emerge through discussion and deliberation over a series of meetings and are intended to guide both technical experts as well as humanitarian actors. We'll also present several tools for the implementation of the principles and guidelines. The impetus for the project was an experience we had during our work several years ago to document the destruction of cultural heritage sites in Syria and Iraq. As that project was underway, ISIS claimed publicly to have destroyed sites, but satellite imagery made evident that that was not true. At the time, the community of those who were monitoring the cultural heritage sites had a conversation about whether in fact we should be making public ISIS's claim and uh, the fact that it was untrue, or whether in fact there was a responsibility not to share such information as it may have jeopardized the site in question. That gave rise to our project focused on the ethical considerations in location-based data and crisis situations, and the development of the principles and guidelines that I mentioned. Those are summarized here in this slide. I'm not going to focus on the first, do no harm, as Alan will be doing that. And I won't read the entire slide, but in summary, uh, the second is forcing us to think about what we know about the need that we're trying to address through the collection of data. That's going to help us define our scope and the limits of what we should and should not be collecting. The third is, is taking into account the exigencies of time during a crisis, but that despite that, we still need to adopt appropriate methods, scientific or ethical constraints to the work that we do, and also take into account that if we jeopardize uh, the, the rigor of the science that we do in collecting and applying and analyzing data, we're also jeopardizing the potential use of those data and its analysis uh, is, as evidence in later litigation. The principle to collaborate and consult is really an overarching principle, the thread of which has to be seen throughout all of the principles and the guidelines. And the fifth, give access to your data, is one that is obviously contingent on the particular uh, idiosyncrasies of the context in which you're working. But it is important to think about the options for sharing data, as it may help to avoid the unnecessary future collection uh, of data in a given context. In general, we aimed in the, in the definition of these principles and guidelines to be agnostic as to the particular type of technology that might be used to either generate or collect the data. And hopefully as a result, the principles and guidelines will be able to survive for some years and the development of technologies as they arise in the future. Complementing the principles and guidelines, we worked with the, the engine room in the development of tools to help in their implementation including the creation of case studies based on real fact scenarios, but anonymized uh, and, and edited for the use of these as tools in training, as awareness raising, uh, and in identifying scenarios in advance that a team might be able to consider so that it can be expeditious in its decision-making process in a crisis. Also complementary tools to the principles and guidelines, are two sets of decision trees. One, addressing the question of should I collect location-based data in a particular crisis situation, and the other about should I share. And these are two tools that Laura will be focusing on in her comments. 
I provide this by way of introduction to our two further speakers, and I also want to acknowledge the team with which I've worked over several years in the development of this project and the National Science Foundation for its support in our work. Thank you, and over to you, Alan. Thanks. It looks like my slide coming up here. So uh, I'm happy to be able to participate uh, in this webinar, and I'm going to be drilling down into one of the principles and focusing primarily on one kind of data that we talked about quite a bit, uh, data that is volunteered geographic information that non-professionals are providing uh, that gets used in these situations. Oops, sorry. Um, I'm going to be focusing in on the data cycle and the questions that we have to think about when we're collecting data, sourcing those data, doing various kinds of analysis, ultimately communicating what we found out, making decisions on storing data, and then at the, when the event is over, making decisions about whether to archive or, or delete those data. In the process of developing these guidelines, we came up with a fairly large number of different points that need to be considered in each step of this data cycle. And I don't have time, obviously, to talk about all of them. So I'm going to focus in on one of the points that is particularly important in each one of these uh, stages. With, with collection, uh, I think one of the things that uh, is often overlooked and it's particularly important is that some of the location-based data that we have available to us, particularly that that's generated by uh, the public, by users that are not professionals, may have been geotagged inadvertently. People might not realize they're actually putting geographic information into their data. Uh, this is particularly true in situations where we're collecting social media and having a of Twitter, one of the reasons that people don't actually understand that they're giving geographic information along with their other information in, in social media is that they don't understand the terms of service because the terms of service are always changing. Uh, and this is just a list of all the changes in terms of service for Twitter specifically. Uh, and when we think about what those terms of service are, we see what some of the problems are. If we look at your rights as a person who has a Twitter account and provides information to the public through Twitter, uh, the license that they have authorizes them to make your content available to the rest of the world and let anybody else do the same. So essentially you have no rights to your data once you put it into the system. Uh, they point out that they if you choose to give the location information, they collect that information, they dis disseminate it, but they also point out that they have a variety of other ways of collecting location information um, about your wireless networks, your cell towers you're near, your IP address, and so forth. So there may be location information that you didn't even need uh, to provide. Now, the fact that there is location information attached to uh, social media, particularly Twitter, that's public and out there for anybody to use has prompted a lot of researchers and practitioners to try to leverage these data to provide situational awareness and other kinds of information in the middle of crisis situations. This is an example of a tool that we built here at Penn State, a series of tools actually that culminated in this one uh, that got completed last year. It essentially mines Twitter data for information about time and place and concepts. So in this particular case, it's query on earthquakes over a particular period of time. We generate tweets on a map that are either from particular locations, from people who have in their profile that they're at, uh, from a particular location, or that talk about particular locations. We, we have natural language processing uh, and geoparsing tools that allow us to extract place references. Uh, we also have the ability to 
look at the individuals, uh, the, the Twitter IDs and information about them. These kinds of systems can provide incredible situational awareness, but you can also see that they have a lot of risks to privacy where people didn't really realize the kind of information they were providing and the fact that it can be aggregated with other people's information. So moving on to uh, sourcing, a uh, key thing here for locational data, we really need to think about identifying the provenance, um, the quality, uh, determining uh, whether the data are useful to us for a particular situation. And this is particularly true with OpenStreetMap, which is a global volunteer generated map of the world, uh, very similar to Google Maps, but freely available to anyone who wants to use it. So it gets used quite often in crisis kinds of situations. One of my former PhD students, Sterling Quinn, uh, got interested in the question of who contributes, what information to open street maps, and where do they contribute it from? We built a visual analytics tool that allowed us to start asking that question and getting some answers. He was particularly interested in South America, and some of the interesting findings that he had were that more of the contributions in South America to building open street map maps are from Germany than they are from South America. Uh, so a lot of volunteers in Germany are creating a map of South America, and a lot of the uh, extractive companies, uh, mining companies, logging companies, and so forth are hiring people to create maps. So basically the map is accurate where those companies are less accurate with different kinds of information in places. So when we use these free maps, we have to be aware of the motivations behind people creating maps and the kind of uh, data that might be there. Okay, um, moving on to analysis. Uh, key thing here is the fact that we can generate new actionable information by stitching together data from a variety of sources. This comes with benefits and risks. As an example of benefit, uh, this is a system we built a few years back uh, when we had some funding from the Gates Foundation uh, working on uh, distributing vaccines in uh, underdeveloped countries. We were particularly focusing on Niger because we were working with collaborators that had, um, they were building infectious disease models for Niger and they needed to know information about where people were when in order to build a, a accurate infectious disease model, but there are not good census data for Niger about where people are, and people do move seasonally uh, for agricultural reasons due to famine, due to war, uh, due to uh, slave trafficking, a variety of kinds of things, and we found that we could use Google News Archive and, and basically build a visual analytics tool that would mine do Google News Archive and allow an analyst to understand the seasonal and other kinds of movement of population in Niger to create a better infectious disease model. But these tools that allow us to link various data sets to build these kinds of pictures also have dangers in terms of the kinds of personal information that might be able to be extracted from these linked data. This is a known problem. Uh, this is an example of a research report from NRC uh, a little bit more than a decade ago that looked into this question. So a lot of researchers have known about this for quite a while. It's still a non-solved problem in a lot of ways. And more importantly, a lot of the researchers that are using volunteer data in crisis situations and the practitioners don't actually even recognize uh, that these problems exist. So if you're interested in this, I encourage you to look at this report and follow up from it. Um, this also relates to, this doesn't have anything to do with crises particularly, but it relates to what's going on with the uh, upcoming census and the issues of differential privacy that are being discussed. The, the challenge of providing census information so that we can answer important questions while not having the potential to get back at individual data, which obviously the census is mandated by law not to uh, 
re revealed. So there were a lot of uh, discussions in the scientific community and it, within the Census Bureau about how they're handling that for the 2020 census. Okay, uh, moving on to communication. Um, being a cartographer by background and somebody who does a lot of work research and visualization, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the potential of what happens when we put volunteer geographic information onto maps and other visual displays and the fact that even if we've obscured data, um, data that we thought were anonymized uh, may no longer be as safe as we thought they, they were. And one of the best recent examples of that, again, not an example related to crisis situations, but an interesting example that some of you may be familiar with is what happened with Strava. Uh, they're a, a fitness app company that makes an app for runners and bicyclists, particularly ones who are serious about their sport. And they had a little bit over a billion records of, of tracks of runners and cyclists in their system and they generated a global map of where everybody was getting this exercise and people started to realize that a uh, number of US soldiers had accidentally revealed the locations of military bases that weren't supposed to be uh, known in various places around the world. Um, Strava fairly quickly took the map offline and made it even more anonymous. But the problem is that once things are visual and they go online, they, they never go away. Uh, I captured these not too long ago. They're examples that were in the news media at the time of some of the locations that were found in the Strava data. And although Strava took their map away, these news agencies did not and other organizations did not. And so anybody can go out and query for this information today. Okay. Uh, Second to last, moving on to storage. Uh, key thing that I want to focus here on is the idea that if you're collecting data that has any potential risk associated, associated with it to individual people, to groups of people, to organizations, encrypting the data is really important. This is some information from a commercial website on data breach rec uh, data breaches uh, since 2013. 15 billion data records lost or stolen since 2013. More of them in the US than anywhere else. We've got six hundred six and a half million data breaches per day uh, globally. But the bottom line here is that if you encrypt your data, you have much less chance of the data being lost or stolen. Only 4% of all these data that are lost or stolen uh, were data that have been encrypted. And uh, finally, once we're at the end of a project, we have the hard question of, we've put all this effort into collecting data, analyzing those data, it might be important in the long run, should we keep it or should we avoid risks by deleting it? And a key thing here is to get input from the affected communities, those that generated the data, uh, get their input uh, on this question. Clearly on the pro side of keeping the data, there, there are a lot of important questions that can be answered uh, with these data. This is an example from uh, some researchers that took 90 years of natural disaster data in the US and came to some very interesting insights about uh, trends in impacts uh, of different disasters over time by having those data. On the negative side, uh, in the UK, the uh, National uh, Health Service there keeps track of medical records as to medical organizations around the world. That's important for maintaining uh, individual and group health. Uh, but it was also discovered that the Home Office in the UK was given access to these data and they were using it to find uh, illegal immigrants. So uh, various negative implications of hanging on to data. And I'll leave you with uh, this more positive example from one of my former PhD students, Brian Tomaszewski. He's, he's been working with people in refugee camps uh, around the world on helping them 
build their own geographic data using mobile GIS technologies to build maps of those refugee camps because many people are, as you know, in those uh, camps for uh, years before they can either uh, move on to a permanent home or move back to the country that, that they had to leave. And those maps are very important for helping them uh, manage their lives while there. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I'll wait a sec while these come up. So, thanks folks. My name is Laura Guzman, and as Jessica introed, I am working with the Engine Room. So I'll be talking about not just the ethical guidelines themselves or the content, I think Alan laid a fantastic foundation there, but as Jessica mentioned, the tools themselves that we developed together with AAAS. Before I get too far, let's see, there we go. I'll give a quick background on who the engine room is. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, we're a global nonprofit organization that supports civil society, social change makers who are using data and tech in their work. And a lot of what we do is answering the question of how we can use tech and data, not just effectively, but also responsibly. And it's kind of through that lens that we partnered with AAAS on this work. Part of what that means for us is translating things like research or guidelines or learnings into actionable tools, summaries, actions themselves that someone could take the idea being that we firmly believe in the importance of guidelines like this, and we also believe in seeing what creative ways we can all work together to make them even more useful with a big emphasis on use um, than they might be if they were to stay in guideline form. So that's a bit what we collaborated on. So with that kind of us plus AAAS, what did we work on? I think Jessica gave a good foundation of this. Um, as she mentioned, we developed two tools, let's say. On the left, you can see, again, some screenshots of the case studies, or of the, excuse me, decision trees that we developed. And then on the right, you can see the case studies. Right now, I'm mostly gonna focus on the decision trees. Um, reason being that we found them to be quite complex to research and create. And through that, I think we highlighted a lot of the intricacies of what thinking about something ethically actually means in practice. To just reemphasize quickly a note on the case studies, they are fictionalized. Those of you who have a lot of knowledge in this sphere will likely see echoes of cases that you're familiar with and have heard about. They're based on desk research and interviews, but we removed identifying information, we combined different cases together, we took some kind of not yet happened cases, but perhaps they could happen cases that we heard in our interviews and wove those in a bit. The idea being that they would be more educational tools than they are, let's say, a historical record. That's mostly what I'll say about that, and we'll jump into the case studies themselves. So as we were approaching this, we wanted to make sure that the tools were at least these three things. This is not an exhaustive list, but we wanted them to be useful. Again, an emphasis on use and usability, not just to one situation, but to many, unlikely all, but we wanted them to, to be useful across a, a couple different spots and spaces. That meant a lot of thinking about the user. Um, for us, that, that wove through the process from the interview phase all the way through to the iteration phase at the end, and I'll show how that was the case in just a minute. We also wanted them to be flexible, flexible enough to form a foundation for someone who's coming into these guidelines and wants to see how they apply to their work so that it wasn't kind of a limiting tool in that someone may approach them and think that the guidelines or the tools are not relevant to them because they're too strict. 
So that meant thinking about not just one context, but multiples. And finally, we wanted them to be complementary. This weaves in a little bit to the usability, but we hoped that in looking at them, people would not just see the very strong tie to the guidelines because the guidelines did form the foundation and the framework around the tools, but that they would also see some similarities or echoes with other tools that are out there and other work that folks have done. I'll jump into the making of the decision trees to give you all a sense of where they came from. As I just mentioned, they're very much based on the principles themselves. I think both Jessica and Alan gave a good overview of that and hopefully you're familiar with them. They're fantastic principles, wonderful guidelines, and they're very, very rich. I recommend you jump in and dissect them and internalize them as you, if you have not had the chance to do that already. So we took that and layered upon it our own independent desk research and interviews with practitioners. The idea here was to gather information and real life experiences from the get go to make sure that that was a big part of what our final output would be. Once we had that kind of all gathered it was a big phase of synthesis that was quite complex and I think at some points a bit unwieldy, not in a bad way, but in a respect for the vastness of this question of the data that is encompassed when we talk about this, about the situations that are included, about the ethical principles and underpinnings that could be implicated. This process involved a lot of different folks on the engine room side, a lot of Google Docs, a lot of comments, um, a lot of revisions and, and thinking through different frameworks. We also at this point were thinking a bit about logic and I don't necessarily mean that just structure, though you can see here that we started attempting to structure this in some sort of tree or flow, but I also mean logic in terms of the ethical underpinnings of making sure that the structure did not just make consequential yeah, sense in a in a row of going through the tree, but also that these ethical guidelines and principles and broader underpinnings were part and parcel of the structure itself. And as a quick note, that web is kind of a third or so, I would say, of the web that we had. Um, so that to say, this was a, an undertaking. The next step, we had a fantastic designer working alongside us and she, Lorraine, I'll have her contact information at the end. Uh, she helped us weave this into a more linear logical flow. And then we started moving from synthesis to visual iterations. This was very fun for me personally, but it was also the phase where we most wanted to make sure we were making the right decisions in what we were included, what we were including, excuse me. We wanted to include a fair bit of content and a fair bit of information so that if someone had the time and the inclination to go deep, they could, but not put it in a way that was overwhelming so that someone who perhaps was just looking for a refresher or a quick intro could also experience the trees in a way that was beneficial to them. This is another version you can see much closer to what we ended up with, where we started outlining the structure a little bit differently, took a lot of feedback from interviewees, from other folks in similar fields, from other colleagues, and kept weaving that in here. We also spoke uh, a lot with AAAS at this phase. The most exciting, I think, part of the development, particularly this, these last phases, was we had the opportunity to travel to DC and participate in a workshop around these guidelines. And during a couple hours and one afternoon, we printed out the decision trees in pretty large format. Apologies for using feet for those of you who use meters, but it was, let's say, about three feet by two feet, big enough so that folks could, as you can see here, cross things out, write things in, add arrows, delete arrows. We had one group 
entirely replace one of the pages with a tree that they would suggest instead. And the thoughts and the knowledge and the feedback that we got was quite rich. And it came from a point of requesting that the folks in attendance attempt to use the tree, pretend to use the tree as if they were in someone else's shoes, and then from that give us suggestions for how they might do it differently. So from all of that came from left to right, a quick cover sheet in blue, and then the two decision trees that you can see in purple and orange red on the right. Something that I neglected to mention earlier on, but that Jessica mentioned was that we did focus on the question of collection and the question of sharing. We thought that this would be important because not only are they kind of endpoints, bookends on the life cycle that Alan used in his presentation, but they also came up repeatedly in interviews and in desk research as areas that were particularly ripe for misstep or error or misjudgment. And we thought that for those reasons, they would be the best to bring in the scope a little bit. As we were doing the work, particularly at the beginning, it was we, were, we quickly noticed how much was included. So we winnowed it down to these two. So in my last five or so minutes, I'll talk a bit about how you can use these tools. As mentioned earlier, the idea is that they be useful for educational uses, project planning or project scoping, um, just general awareness building and general edification of thoughts around ethics, perhaps reviewing projects or programs in, in retrospect to identify different spots where things could have gone differently. So the idea is that they bridge that both practical and educational uh, kind of scope. A quick note, if you download these, you can take a look at, at this in a bit more detail, but we did include a section on how to use the tool. We focus on what to do if you get to a stopping point. There are a few sections where the flow leads you to an exclamation point and a stop. And we add the caveat that this, both tools and the case studies are not meant to be exhaustive. Um, they don't cover all potential scenarios, nor are all parts of them going to be relevant to each scenario, but that they are meant, again, in the way that we structured them and in the way that we included content, they are meant to provide that ethical foundation and basic ethical education to someone who is perhaps new to thinking about things that way or new to using geolocated data more generally. So we'll jump into one case. Let's say, and this is one of the case studies that was included. So let's say we are a group of volunteer UAV or drone operators. We, for argument's sake, let's say we're sitting in the US and we're hearing news of mudslides and flooding in another country. We're interested in going to that country and using our skills and expertise in drones in order to capture some data that would be useful to responders to the mudslides and to the flooding. And the question is, should we even collect this data? So this is on the beginning side of the flow. This is what the top bit of the should I collect case or decision tree looks like. You'll notice that we foregrounded it with these considerations that are meant to, again, to give that educational layer and kind of kick things off, framing it in a way that people see this is not a checklist. This is not okay, we did one, two, three, we are ethical, but that it is a bit more complex and depending on how deeply you wanna go into these can become uh, quite interesting, I think. So the first question in this tree is about objective. Do you have a well-defined objective for using this data? Will this objective help the crisis affected communities? Let's say as a group, we all agree that we do have an objective for the data we collect. We would be helping save lives. We can put it very simply and say, sure, yes. It suggests we document this and get agreement from team members. We go ahead, do that, and we think, okay, we're good to go. 
Question two is contextual knowledge based. How well do you know the context of the crisis? If we're being honest with ourselves, we have a few members who have been there, but by and large, we're pretty new and most of us have not worked in that context before. So we answer not at all because it feels kind of like the most true. The next question is, are you working with those familiar with the context? And at this point, we haven't been in touch with anyone who is based in the country or who has expertise specifically on that kind of disaster in that region. And we get to a stopping point. Like I said, these pop up often and we think they're very, very important. This one says, seek out partnerships. Do not collect this data until you have relationships with those familiar with the context. The idea is that this isn't stop and do not go on ever again, but that the suggestion is concrete enough that we, let's say we as this group of drone enthusiasts can take the steps here and restart the tree from the get-go. We included these because they came up so often as something that wasn't necessarily happening. We heard a lot of cases where folks maybe tried to flag something that maybe was off or noticed something but weren't able to take action to remedy it. And we wanted to really emphasize that doing using this kind of data ethically could require more time. It could require more resources. It could require more pre-planning that this is a critical lens by which to look through this work, but it's not necessarily going to be something that you just slap on and keep going. And that's probably not uh, hugely new to any of you listening in, but we did see it as kind of one of, if not the most critical takeaways here was that need for that pause and that stop. But wait, um, depending on who's answering these questions, could be there could be different answers. So real quick, going through this one again, same question, do we have an objective? Let's say someone else in the group is answering this and they think, you know, I don't know if quote unquote saving lives is really that well defined. So right off the bat, they say no. And again, the stopping point suggests that you understand what you'll need it for, how it will benefit the communities, and that you articulate that. And I, I go over that just to highlight that the same situation can be interpreted many different ways. So don't worry. It's not only knows that we get to, and I'll chat about that in just one second. I'm going to skip quickly over these cases for the sake of time. This one, again, you can look at them if you download the materials, International Humanitarian Health Organization, who are considering sharing the location of their clinic locations for in order to coordinate with a partner who get stuck on the fact that the data becoming public or aggregated could certainly put others at risk. So in this case, it recommends a fairly hard stop of no, not to share the clinic location data. Um, and again, this is particularly relevant in the case of a conflict. So back to that kind of, not all of the answers are no, but the no is important. There are, in the case of the drone case, many different ways that the project creators and shapers could form the project so that it goes all the way through. Um, but respecting and honoring the points where it does get snagged is important in order to continue in a way that is responsible and respectful of the folks who are reflected in the data. As I was talking about with the kind of positionality and the, the position and power of the person answering the trees, it is kind of ambiguous and not all people will answer the questions in the same way and that's okay. And that's something that we added a caveat for in the cover sheet. But again, they're more meant to be tools for thinking than absolute clear ways to create a perfect quote unquote project. And then lastly, there's no one way. So embedded within these tools and within thinking about ethics more broadly, 
though something may get flagged as potentially bringing additional risk to folks involved, there isn't one or two or just three ways to mitigate that risk. One way may also may always be to stop and to not continue, but in other cases, the scenario might require that continuing is the way to reduce the risk. So again, it's all a bit, despite the fact that the trees are linear and nice flowing, embedded within them is a lot of room for creativity, a lot of room for ambiguity and respect for the idea that there's not just one way to practice these decisions ethically. So I'll wrap it up there. I'm excited to be here and thank you all for your time. If you wanna reach out to any of us, here are some handles, the engineer, myself, Laura, and the designer we worked with, Lorraine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura, for that. Uh, it's now time for questions um, and hopefully some answers. So those of you who are listening into the webinar, uh, you'll find on the right hand pane uh, under the heading questions, your opportunity there to type in questions uh, that I will, um, I will feed through to our uh, speakers. And so while those on the webinar have the opportunity to think about the questions that they'd like to ask. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that in the same place where you see the questions, you'll also see a tab that says handouts. Uh, you will find there a copy of the principles and guidelines themselves, as well as the case studies and the decision trees. There are links there. If for whatever reason you don't access them there, you can of course also find them on our program website. And here is that website. So uh, with that, um, Alan, I wanted to ask you the first question, uh, if I may. And that is, you mentioned engagement of the community uh, at the stage of deciding whether to, to store data or to destroy data once you've used it for its initial purposes. And I wondered if you had any uh, positive examples or lessons learned that you would want to share about effective engagement of communities? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. The, I, I don't have a lot of very good examples personally, uh, but the, I guess a couple of the situations that, that I, uh, know about that I think are worth considering are the variety of data that have gotten collected, particularly in developing countries, uh, particularly Africa. Um, the a lot of the countries there have country monopolies on cell phone coverage and the countries are willing to um, often make those data available or researchers or practitioners in different kinds of situations. And I, I think that's a case where there has not been engagement with the community. There's been engagement with the government entity who owns the data, but not with the people who are generating it. So I think thinking about ways to deal with that kind of situation where there's an overall organization that has some official power that that has the data and they don't actually let you easily get back at the community to talk to them i think we have to figure out ways to address that and it hasn't been done yet okay thank you alan i i appreciate that assessment of of where we are and um, obviously a practical issue that still needs to be considered by um, those of us working in this field recognizing that of course an example that might be effective in one community may not work uh, in another but it's an area of great significance uh, i mentioned that one of the principles is focused on collaborating and consulting and is intended to be a thread that runs through the principles and guidelines um, and it's clearly an area in which um, more thought needs to be given. Uh, Laura, uh, a question from you, uh, sorry, for you. Uh, you. You talked a little bit about um, the decision trees that may lead to a 
uh, following it and it may lead to a hard stop and that you're not always going to get to know and there are ways of, of getting around that. In practice, in the work that you have done, what have you seen as um, some, of, some of the approaches to, to that, that that organizations have taken when they get to a no or perhaps they should have got to a no. Um, what do you see as the general practice in this area and are there, are there, is there room for improvement? Thanks for the question. I would say, and this is based mostly upon the research that we did here and around other kind, other fields' approach to ethics and approach to using data responsibly there certainly is room for improvement. Um, when we were talking to folks about geolocated data in these crisis situations, I was, I'm a bit hard pressed to think of an example that came up where the no was fully respected before something happened, before there was some sort of risk that was realized. Um, and, I'll say just one thing that emerged from looking at that and speaking with different people on it was the importance of the pre-plan of the spotting the potential missteps in advance and embedding that respect for the folks who are represented in the data, uh, the respect for their well-being and the importance of minimizing risk to them from the beginning being quite important. Um, and while that does happen, I think because of the nature of this work is meant to be helpful, let's say it's a natural disaster, folks are going in there with the intent to help. There is a bit of a more subtle layer of thinking about it responsibly and all of the different directions that that takes that seemed to emerge as a, an important let's say first step or one of many ways that that could be improved. Thank you, Laura. So I see there was sort of engaging with the principles around doing no harm and that that should be a guide in all of our decisions and also defining our purpose. What is the need that we're aiming to address? And are we going to um, exacerbate the need or inadequately address it? Or is there an alternative to addressing that need? Um, certainly in some of the work that we do in the program, we have seen that there's a great enthusiasm and excitement about new opportunities offered by uh, new methods or new technologies. And it's that excitement that drives the um, a research process or a, or a humanitarian process where the technologies are being used rather than the needs. And I think from what you're saying is you're really focusing on, on the needs of the community and engaging the community and defining those needs and what risks are not acceptable to them uh, is obviously key. Absolutely. So we have a question here. What new threats do we expect? Um, and in the context of this discussion, I'll take it as what new threats do we expect with regard to the types of data um, that we're seeing emerge and being able to be used and, and maybe thinking rather than of threats, we can think about risks as well. Um, Alan or Laura, who would like to take that first? Well, I, I can start. Um, I think what part of the new threat, I mean, it's a threat and an opportunity is the uh, rapid advance in AI technology, artificial intelligence technology, and the ability to extract actionable information from very large complex data sets. There are a lot of pluses to that, obviously, in terms of the kinds of insights that we can get in a hurry to uh, handle situations. One of, one of my uh, colleagues uh, worked with a group to essentially train tools on Twitter data to identify information about earthquake impacts in different countries. And they were able to get the tools to um, be retrained fast enough that within a couple hours of an earthquake, they could be collecting information for, for a different country than they collected for. And it was you know quite 
uh, accurate uh, filtering to find only the useful information and so forth. On, on the other hand, there, there's a lot of dangers in this technology in terms of uh, privacy issues, uh, putting groups at risk who might be in politically sensitive situations and, and that sort of thing. And you know, everybody probably heard the news uh, a few days ago about uh, Facebook starting to create their own currency. And uh, you know, all that's linked to you know, the individuals and where they are and all that sort of thing. So that's a new kind of geographic information that didn't exist before that we don't know anything about it, how it's going to be used. Thanks, Alan. Laura, did you want to take that as well, or should we move to the next question? I'll add a quick layer. I think Alan did a good job highlighting the kind of tech and data side. One layer being of the additional threat brought by a concentration of power that is implied when the tools for data collection and the data, data that is collected itself is in, let's say, a privately owned silo, whether that's Facebook or Google or another company entirely ad tech companies, for example, on and on. Um, and the limited access that individuals have to that data in just everyday life, and that I think that dynamic is exaggerated even more in crisis situations. So that kind of, I, that, I see that power as a threat as well. That's really helpful, thank you both. Um, we have another question um, asking, is there a difference in conduct when dealing with non-crisis situations, or is it safe to reasonably generalize this tool uh, to both contexts? I would venture a pretty quick yes, that I think the both the guidelines and the tools themselves are fairly applicable to non-crisis situations as well. I think what the crisis lens adds is a bit more urgency and is particularly helpful in refining that focus on the rights and safety of folks who are represented in the data. I don't know, Alan, if you have anything to add here. Uh, yeah, they, I guess the only thing I'll add is that a, lo a lot of the guidelines focus on the balance between risk and benefit, uh, and the risk benefit changes a bit in certain kinds of crisis situations uh, be because of whatever the crisis is about and the kind of risk that it puts people to immediately um, might cause us to collect information, for example, in some situations where we would not want to collect it if there wasn't a crisis going on. But then that puts us in the situation of thinking about what we do with the information after the event is over. Great, thank you both. Um, is there a way in which the decision tree might be useful in resolving internal disagreements concerning how to respond to a crisis? Um, Laura, do you want to start? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think the we hope that the answer is yes. That's a, a real scenario that we thought about in creating them, particularly when you're thinking about kind of questions of positionality. So that to say who is within an organization, looking at it, the organization unit, who is sitting, let's say, in a headquarters versus who is in the location where the crisis happened within that location of where the crisis is happening who are the folks from headquarters and who are the ones doing the data collection are they internal to the organization were they hired specifically to gather data and then again in the in the question that alan focused on in part of his comments of data that is collected without folks knowing that it had been collected let's say that's twitter location data so the idea is that Yes, um, because different people would answer the questions most likely a bit differently. And hopefully that would provide a space to answer, to actually have that conversation about why the question answers are different. I, Though I won't go so far as to say that the decision trees themselves would structure that conversation. I think that would be a different resource, um, but certainly they could be used to highlight the internal differences and disagreements and different ways forward. Thank you, Laura Allen. Well, I'll, I'll just add that I was at the workshop uh, where we marked up the earlier versions of the decision trees and, and the, the exercise of just doing that, talking about the different points really drew out a lot of things that some of us might not have thought about. So it was very useful. Great, thank you. Um, without 
naming and shaming, and obviously the response to this question um, is really going to be one of, of people's sense of this rather than anything empirical, but what percentage, the question is, what percentage of organizations currently do not use the approach outlined in the principles and guidelines? Alan, do you want to start? Well, I, I don't, I don't think I have enough uh, information to really answer that question very well. Being more of a researcher and not a practitioner, um, my, my guess is that there are a fairly large number of grassroots organizations that sort of pop up around technologies that think they can do something useful, but they're not part of the more professional crisis response community that, that probably are not thinking about these ethical issues as they're getting started. That sounds fair. Laura? I would add that uh, I, I have very little way to give a set percentage, but I would kind of add to that question or answer that question by saying that it's not necessarily something that one can do completely. I don't, at least in the way that we were thinking about it, there's not a, okay, and now we are being ethical or now we are being responsible. Um, there are questions of available resources, whether it's time, money, or personnel. There are questions again of power. There are many different intersecting things that make parts of this easier to adopt and parts of it harder to adopt. And some organizations may be thinking about it, but may find it a bit more challenging to implement it. Or some organizations maybe just naturally implement things in a more ethical way, but aren't always having internal conversations about it. So I would say that I think more and more the, the even just the idea of ethics in tech is becoming more prevalent, but the adoption of it looks completely different depending on what you're looking at. So that's a really hard question to absolutely say, just because it's going to look very differently in different places. I think that's a fair response. And I think, you know, as Alan was pointing out, if you're coming more from the, the side of expertise in the technology, you may not be thinking about the ethical or human rights uh, context in which you're working and, and, the, and the implications. But similarly, if you're coming from the human rights or humanitarian field with insufficient understanding of the technologies and the data and how it can be used, you may not see risks that others who are experts um, on that side may. So uh, there are blind spots that we all have um, and making ourselves aware of those and trying to be explicit in addressing them, I think is something that hopefully both the principles and guidelines, but also the tools will help us achieve. Well, with that, um, we've come to our time and the end of the webinar. I want to again thank uh, our speakers, Alan McCachran and Laura Guzman, for their contributions, both on the webinar, but in the project overall, uh, and to those other voices of uh, many individuals who fed into this process. Thank you also to the National Science Foundation for their support. And, uh, all the best if anybody has any questions about the project uh, or trouble in linking to the resources please don't hesitate hesitate to contact us at the email address on the slide thank you very much <laughs>